New School University now. Uh, I live in, in old times, I'm afraid. Uh, I don't think I'll ever get over the older uh, name. Uh, but um, in New York, uh, Vicky Hattam, uh, Brian McGrath, Jane Perone, and Vigianti Rao. And uh, they'll say more about uh, themselves and their work uh, as this proceeds. Uh, Vigianti, I think, will uh, provide a way uh, in uh, to the rest of the panelists. So welcome. We look forward to this conversation. Uh, and uh, uh, as I say, there'll be a robust conversation once their presentations are done. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, David, and thank you, Akbar, for inviting us uh, to this conversation, to this, uh, to this table. Um, we know that uh, SECT has had um, a long history, and um, at the new school, um, this sort of relationship to our own history uh, is embedded in our name, the new school. Um, it seems that it's a place where there's been uh, many moments of critical reinvention, um, which uh, make us, in some sense, a very contemporary institution. And um, from, uh, speaking for myself, uh, I've been at the New School for four years. And in these four years, um, the crucial conversation that's been underway at the New School is precisely how uh, to forge the university of the 21st century uh, from uh, the pieces that we have uh, at uh, a very, very unique institution. Um, and um, I'll say that, of course, uh, the piece that, is, that would be most well known in this room is the New School for Social Research with its legacy and its contribution um, to critical theory. Um, but um, in fact, um, as we all know, within the institutions, it is the Parsons School of Design uh, that really drives us in many ways, uh, that contributes um, our infrastructure um, and, and, and really makes it possible for us to exist as an institution. Uh, so this, um, and, and this realization has actually provoked an incredibly uh, productive conversation at the university on what the relationship is between design and um, social research. Um, and, um, and, and, this, uh, and that relationship, is, as we saw um, in uh, some of our contributions, um, has to do with the nature of intervention, with the nature of uh, pedagogy, uh, and with the nature of, uh, um, of critical social science, and what it can contribute um, in a world that's um, really characterized not by uh, a kind of um, uh, as Vicky put it in one of our conversations, not by sense of punctuated equilibrium, but by a sense of incessant change. Um, that said, I um, would like to, uh, so uh, I'd like to say that really in our panel, what we're hoping to do um, is not really present the kind of um, pedagogical experiments uh, that we've been working with, but to um, introduce to you some of the ways in which um, we as social scientists, this is speaking for myself, and Brian and Jane as um, designers, um, have been challenged to rethink some of our own methodological um, and um, um, theoretical frames by this engagement. So that really will be the focus of each of our presentations. And we will start with uh, Vicky Hatham, who uh, has just finished um, a stint as the chair of the politics department at NSSR, um, and um, followed by Brian McGrath, who is an urban designer, um, an architect, and um, teaches in, the, in what is called the School for Constructed Environments in uh, uh, the Parsons uh, uh, School of Design, um, and then followed by uh, Jane Perone, who is um, uh, interaction designer and also um, the uh, the author and initiator of a very of a rather contradictory project, uh, which is the guide for uh, which is called uh, Not for Tourists. Very ironic that 
you would have a guide not for tourists, but I'm sure all of you know, are familiar with uh, the NFT books, uh, at least those of you coming from uh, the States. So this is uh, Jane Perron, and um, I will offer a few reflections on uh, what this work has meant for me, uh, uh, particularly as an ethnographer and as an anthropologist, uh, these collaborations. So that's it, let me um, pass on to Vicky. Okay. Um, I'd like to say a little bit about where I think my own head is um, in trying to uh, step into this gap between the social sciences and design. I feel like I um, came of age intellectually in what I now think of as Ford a Fordist intellectual division of labor that um, many of us, I think, have uh, toiled away in different social science disciplines which was established in very short order at the beginning of the 20th century and a very precise kind of carving up of intellectual terrain which is policed, I've come to see, remarkably uh, forcefully over the course of my graduate uh, career and subsequent uh, work uh, in large-scale research, prestigious research institutions in the United States. Um, and I, along with many others who I think have uh, ended up in this room or rooms very much like this at the New School, have uh, come to feel the frustration and the limits of those um, intellectual divisions that were set in place many years ago, um, or, dec or a century ago. In political science in particular, I think we were given uh, in that initial carving up in the, uh, the discipline of political science was set up in 1903. Um, power and the state, but culture and society were left for anthropology and sociology. And if any poor graduate student in political science starts being interested in culture, sociological things, they're often taken aside at the end of the seminar and saying, are you sure you're really in the right place? You know, maybe you should go upstairs to anthropology. <laughs> um, and it's a sense, I think, with the fact that uh, it's not possible to think through questions of power, at least for me, and anyone who's sort of followed the linguistic and post-structuralist work to think through issues of power in the state without stepping into the terrain of culture and society. Um, and it seems to me this uh, leaping into the gap with Parsons, which has mostly felt pretty much like a free fall, um, is just a further extension of trying to sort of decolonize uh, myself from this Fordist intellectual division of labor. And, um, I'd say where I am right this minute, and you'll maybe get a sense of it in the presentation, is that I think of myself as rewiring my intellectual infrastructure. And I'd have to say that I think I'm in a process of uh, deconstruction, uh, decay, kind of, it's uh, half, half rewired. So there's not a moment, I don't feel like it's, uh, it's not complete, the project is not complete, but I have felt, found it a mixture of extremely frustrating, um, and many of the conversations have felt like failures, and simultaneously extremely exhilarating to feel like that my intellectual uh, map has, is shifting. Um, and I feel it in quite uh, two quite simple ways. One is in my filing system that I've kind of, without much planning, but kind of elaborated, as we all have, a set of files, subjects, authors, and, and I have all this stuff from the last two or three years that I can't, I don't know where it goes. Um, and I, every time I realize that, I'm actually I'm like, wow, that's actually great. Something has, shift, something has shifted, and I don't know where to put it, but I know it doesn't go in the old files. So I take that as a moment of accomplishment. Um, and the second one is when I slip back into political science and I read a political science journal article and there's an instant sense of death. Um, <laughs> and there is no going back for me. So I cannot read a plain, singularly text-based article anymore. I, know, I mean, it's a little worrying, but at least, I ha at least I have tenure, so it's maybe not so bad. But there's a sense that I have changed um, for sure, but I am not really yet fully able to you know, present you with a nice package that you can take home. So you're going to, going to get a half, uh, a half something. Um, I had lots of thoughts about what to present. I, I have kind of a larger argument that I'm 
really interested in about thinking about visual assemblages, I guess, and visuality, everyday visuality as a site of suturing and assemblage, which seems to me the kind of key site of um, politics. Uh, but uh, in the end, so I, I developed two presentations and I kind of tried to mesh them together. And then last night when we were walking, um, Brian said, you're crazy. That's so many slides, you're not going to do that. So if other people would like me to, it's too many, you'll take up all the time, which is probably true. So I've left aside the visual assemblages thing, but in the long term, I think that that's really where I'm headed, trying to really learn to read the visuals in a way that I can be tuned into the acts of suturing that happen visually. Um, so I'm going to actually present um, a little bit more uh, straightforward uh, microcosm of a piece of research that I've been doing um, uh, with Carlos Yescas, who is Carlos here? I think he's, uh, uh, anyway, he has been around the conference for the last two weeks. Uh, he's a graduate student who I've done this work with collaboratively um, over the last two years. So um, when he comes in, uh, you can also equally ask him questions. And this grew out of, I've, I've for a long time been working around questions of immigration and race. I finished up a book which uh, tried to understand why in the United States, it's very American-based research, why in the United States we have a language both of ethnicity and of race, and how those two languages work together and co-constitute each other. Ethnicity as about culture and linguistic difference, and race as about bodily difference, body and blood. And so I did a sort of sweep through the 20th century, but mostly through texts and through institutional, institutionalization um, around the census and other things. I ended up that book with a somewhat hopeful sense that perhaps the current wave of immigration was, I, I, in the book the argument is that this is actually a very pernicious distinction in the United States between uh, ethnicity and race. And that w as, when we keep claiming ethnic difference, it actually reinscribes a racial difference um, in all sorts of pernicious ways. The book ended up with the sense that over the, out of the last wave of immigration in the United States over the last four decades, that there were, especially with Latino um, immigration in particular, but not only, but perhaps there was a possibility of um, undoing that distinction between ethnicity and race and forging a sort of broader um, non-white coalition. Many people, many academics have been kind of marching down the same track. In fact, I would say that that's the most common kind of argument that's being pursued is how a contemporary immigrants identifying racially and politically in the United States. And the assumption has been to kind of look for the emergence of the possibility of a kind of, in shorthand, black-brown coalition. That if immigrants uh, kind of break with the past and stop identifying as white, that you might get the possibility of a different kind of politics of opposition. And then in 2006, as many of you may be aware, there were these enormous immigrant rallies, which this visual on the, uh, up on the screen is from Chicago of May Day 2006. You know, four or 500,000 immigrants in LA, um, Houston, Chicago, uh, less in other cities, but across the country, really a massive sense of um, becoming, coming out of the shadows and into the streets from immigrant politics. At the end of my book, I read that as actually a connection back to civil rights politics and um, tried to, again, see this emergence of uh, rethinking of ethnic identification in the United States. So Carlos and I headed off to uh, Boston. He had like fabulous contacts in Boston. We were interested in trying to look at the organizations and political processes behind these uh, mobilizations, these May Day mobilizations. So um, the visuals don't always match up to the, the place, but it was such a great photograph, I wanted to use it. Um, but what was, uh, they were all over, um, every newspaper carried, uh, tons of these beautiful ones from LA, beautiful ones from Chicago. I'm not going to show them all. But they were often, uh, not the LA ones, but many of them were these multi-flag, multi, you know, this is multi culty in the streets. Um, and so Carlos and I went uh, to see um, what sort of institutions and organizations had helped to bring about this mobilization. And what we found both um, in the interviews and in the um, visuals that in fact uh, 
Well, let me just begin with an anecdote. We walked, walked into a small NGO, I guess, um, sort of activist org organization in Jamaica Plain that had been highly recommended to us as some way that was doing interesting work. And so it was Carlos, myself, and this African-American man. And we started talking. And then early on in the interview, the man went across to me, touched me on the shoulder, and he said, sister, uh, you and I can talk together, but him, pointing at Carlos, him, we don't have to agree, we just have to learn to do business together. And I was like, ooh, my hopes of a black-brown coalition began to crumble before my eyes. Um, I thought that, and it was remarkable how in the interviews with Carlos present, the tension between race, between African-Americans and Latinos were very palpable. Um, so I began to, we began to think that, in fact, and that there was a superficial language of linking immigrant rights and civil rights, but it, when probed at all, there was very little underneath it. Um, very little connection amongst the organizations, very little depth to it. It was really a, just a superficial discourse, I think. Um, but then we came across a bunch of other visuals, and partly I'm thinking of Anne's presentation, um, the other night where she said, uh, like, thinking through the object. What I found interesting about this research is that the visuals for me have not illustrated my, the arguments that I would have come to out of my textual research, but have actually led us to sort of reframe uh, where we see the uh, politics of immigration right now and what I would go and do the research for. So I think the visuals have driven the research agenda rather than, the other, rather than illustrating it. So Carlos was in Chicago and he sent back uh, this image. This was of May 2008. And again, a fabulous uh, photograph uh, taken by Carlos. And what is striking, uh, both in this one and then in this next one, um, is again, flags, but not multi culti this time so much, but the presence of you know, large numbers of rainbow flags, which in the United States are uh, uh, signal icon for gay rights, and as in the front here, you see uh, lesbian and gay support immigrant rights. Um, and so what we ended up thinking, both through the interviews and these visuals, was that we had went, the sort of summary version of our research was that we went looking for immigration and race, and in the end, we found something quite different, sex and faith. Um, so there was a lot of talk, um, but it was not without this, this uh, connection, linkage between immigrant rights and gay rights, was not without its uh, fissures and uh, divisions. That in fact, many of the people we interviewed, the activists, talk, kind of confirmed that yes, that there, there were these uh, bridges being built more between uh, gay rights and immigrant rights than between civil rights and immigrant rights. But that there was also enormous pushback from the church uh, was usually the way it was phrased. So that one of the um, editors of a little ethnic newspaper described having run gay-friendly uh, stories in his newspaper, and the evangelical church called him up and threatened to pull the advertising. Said, you either pull the story or we pull the money, which was kind of a shock to me, I guess, that it would be so blunt. Um, another person we interviewed uh, who had been responsible for mapping the route of the Boston uh, Immigrant Rights March around the Common. And uh, when he ended it at the Baptist Church on the Common, got immediately got calls from several gay rights groups saying, if you end the march there, we will not go with you. That's an incredibly homophobic church. We won't do it. So we ended up seeing both the possibilities and um, tensions within this rethinking uh, of where the coalitional politics are. And then I'm going to do a really quick, because I've got two minutes left, run through of where this has taken us. Um, I've ended up, and I know nothing about religion. I was brought up in a completely, without any religious uh, sentiment or experience. But I've come to see, actually, the church as incredible site of politics right now in the United States. Not in terms of sort of fundamentalism and the new rights, but in terms of immigrant politics. And so when you started, we started looking around, you see these church signs which signal kind of a more gay friendly, uh, they put the rainbow flag on the front. I'm gonna run through these images very fast. 
another one here with her uh, rainbow flag out the front, trying to sing signal a kind of openness around issues of sexuality, which is not what the, the church is known for. Um, so clearly we have to look inside the church and not see it as simply a homogenous organization. And then also once you start to look, uh, lots of linkages between immigration and faith. These are in Sunset Park, this uh, enormous connection between the Chinese community and a a bunch of very established, as you will see, substantial churches here. Um, th this is uh, well, another one where I was interested in this. I went around with Nora Krug, in, who's from Parsons, and was pointing out the way the signs, these ones are horizontal, uh, so which language is being followed in terms of uh, the design. Um, and then I'll, I'll conclude by talking about uh, so these large ones in Sunset Park look at immigration, immigrants and the congregations have become, uh, have enormous ethnic and uh, particularly in these Chinese congregations. But then once you look around New York, there's also these tons of storefront churches. And I'm just going to run through a bunch of images here. These are actually in sort of Yuppie Park Slope, which is where I live. Um, this one um, in East New York, a more uh, black working class area, is actually on a row. It's actually very like shopping in New York. If you want to go and buy lights, you go to the Bowery where you'll have you know, 50 lighting stores all in a row. You want to buy shoes, you go to 8th Street. You want to buy Indian food, you go to 6th Street. Maybe it's not very good Indian food. But, um, but the churches are the same. There's a street and it has... Um, not just one little church like this, this is situated in amongst a row of like 11 little storefront churches, all in a row on one tiny block. Um, so a bunch of the other ones, maybe my favorite one is this one, which I think is uh, striking perhaps because of the purple. Um, and also the stonework. The stonework tends, tends, now that I've been looking more at them, to be uh, uh, repeated across many of them. So this is a close-up of it. Um, this is next door. Um, another little facade of the, with the cross and the, the white, the fake stone. The uh, graphic next door is actually a rent strike building. Um, this is another facade with stone front. And what I've ended up, so I'm at the point, or Carlos and I are at the point of trying to figure out, okay, so now we've taken to a different place, but I don't know what happens inside these churches. I, I can look at the facades. My question is, so what's happening in terms of actual practices? Are these meaningful churches, uh, and that I don't know. I think we need to actually go inside. Um, this one, it seems to me, is an invitation to do so. I kind of like the sign, sign broken, come inside for the message. Um, and I don't know whether that's a ploy, just to get you in, or whether the sign really is broken, um, but I kind of need to know. It's clear from all of these, you'll see that many are Bilingual, many of the services are bilingual. They will specify on the outside whether the pastors and ministers have, speak a multilingual or not. Um, and then this is another one from the same area and another one from, uh, this is from Red Hook. These last three, in some ways, uh, sorry, I have to go back to the purple one and I should have looped them better as Brian had suggested, but these ones here, the clearly a Latino church and then this seems to me to signify in lots of ways in terms of blues and it is a distinctively African-American community. And so in a weird way the visuals have both changed the question and returned me to the original question but I feel like at a different altitude. So I still have the question of like who's in these churches, are, are these congregations multi-ethnic, multi-racial or distinctively organized in their own little storefronts? Um, and in many ways, that's the same question about where the, what's the relationship across these ethnic groups. But I feel like rather than, um, that if I had followed the academic literature, I would have been left at a kind of incredibly flying at 30,000 feet, as I'm about to tomorrow. Uh, this feels to me like I've got the same question, but uh, in a way grounded in um, the possibility of tying it to practices um, that I hope will help me answer that question. Uh, maybe next year. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Brian McGrath. Um, I'm new to the new school as well as a full-time professor. Uh, I've been trained as an architect at Princeton and, and uh, uh, taught for 15 years in a post-professional uh, uh, urban design program at Columbia University where Arch uh, 
graduates of architecture programs from around the world come to seek an urban design degree. And um, teaching that program about 13 of those 15 years ago uh, led me to um, take uh, uh, an addition position at uh, Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok. So um, since 98-99, uh, I've been co-teaching at Columbia and uh, doing, you know, very, very deep work in, uh, about globalization and urbanization in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, the um, uh, opportunity of a fellowship at the India China Institute at the New School was extraordinary because it allowed me the opportunity uh, to take that work not as a kind of solo mission, but to enter into a comparative discussion um, and I know I'm um, being on very dangerous grounds to talk about comparative studies, and maybe we can talk about how to do that after uh, yesterday's discussion, um, but with scholars from India and China, and so it's been great. Uh, Vajanti was a co-fellow with me, uh, and, uh, and it was a two-year rotation between uh, residencies in India residencies in China, or residencies in New York. And so that um, is a great model if we're looking for models um, to do both transdisciplinary and uh, uh, transnational research. Uh, so I approach designing China from Bangkok. And Bangkok has just been assaulted by the Beijing office of OMA with this building. Um, Ben may be chuckling because you read the Financial Times. Uh, who else reads the Financial Times here? No? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this appeared July 20th, so this is really fresh meat. Um, and this is the latest work from the Beijing office of OMA for a building that's called Maha Nakon. Do you want to translate the Sanskrit for us, for Maha Nakon? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I or Sanskrit very well, but I do uh, know that it sounds sort of like Mahanagara, uh -huh. which is yes, it's not quite uh, yeah. how Ole translates it. Yes, <laughs> so this this is a piece of the royal name for Bangkok, which um, is the longest name of a city in the world. Bangkok is the name of the Chinese uh, trading community that existed before the kings relocated the capital of Siam from Ayutthaya to Bangkok. Um, and this tower takes that name by its developer, um, uh, uh, who is, has attracted Ritz-Carlton residences to be one of the tenants, and Ian Schrager Hotel as another tenant, um, to, uh, to build this building, the tallest building in Bangkok. Uh, what I want to bring to the table in this great metropolis of Shanghai is, um, uh, and part of this metropolitan discourse of uh, critical studies and architecture and design. I should add that because of this, I'm very new to design. I mean, you have to understand I was trained and taught for years in an architecture program within liberal arts institutions. Princeton and Columbia teaching architecture is a very different animal than <laughs> Parsons Design New School. And one of the things that makes it, for me, a much friendlier panda-like animal is um, <laughs> work like Vicky's, because as a gay scholar, it's been impossible to work at Columbia. Um, so uh, I have to say that uh, the translation of Mahanakon is Metropolis by the Office of Metropolitan Architecture. That's what OMA stands for. So I would like to use this image, which is really frightening for us who come from New York. If you look at the image of a cracked building with a cloud in the background that looks too familiar, and uh, there was a discussion about disaster politics last night, so I think um, we can talk about that. But the designers talk about it as a kind of breaking of the classic modern glass box. And what's breaking it is the Tower of Babel. And you know that painting of the Tower of Babel that uh, Cool Houses uses in Delirious New York. Um, so 
me if you want me to click on Just forward, yeah. Uh, can you go? More? Yeah. I mean, we're juicy. I mean, you see the, you know, the, the erosion of the towers, in fact, to afford all these Ritz-Carlton residences with private balconies and mm -hmm. gardens and swimming pools. But next slide. But this is the drawing I want to talk about. The rhetoric of the architect is this crack of the building. Can you see this? The street vendors are invading the building. The vitality and the exuberance of the Asian metropolis is the Tower of Babel that's uh, eroding this glass monolith. And so this is a way for me to introduce a kind of theoretical framework that um, in a project for the Architectural Theory Handbook that SAGE is publishing for critical studies audience that Vajanti and I have been working on. Um, and the theoretical um, framework that uh, David Graham, Shane, and I have, have put forward is the new social hierarchy of the global city. And the new social hierarchy of the global city is the metropolis. And we're in it right here. This art, recreated art deco, nostalgic piece. So this is OMA's project. It's a revival of the jazz age. Fritz Lang, look at Poudin, Watch the movie, okay? It's nostalgia, it's revivalist. It's not the future. I laugh when, I, sorry if I gently, can I use you? She said, oh, look, at, is, this is the future, Fudong. I said, no, <laughs> this is the past. It's <laughs> right, see, you're being unfair to me because, you know, coming from Mumbai. <laughs> right, right, right. That is our future. <laughs> <laughs> Touche, um, as always. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, where was I? So the, um, so the hierarchy is, and it's not this cosmological hierarchy because um, the royal city of Krungtep Mahanakorn is part of a, a Buddhist cosmology of 34 layers where you go from the material world to the immaterial world, from sensation to non-sensation, and the last layer is, beyond materiality and sensation. So it's not the me metropolis, Mahanakorn, um, which is, of course, the met metropolis is all about sensation so, and the material world. It's like the lowest level of uh, the cosmology of uh, the uh, global city before uh, European modernism. So um, it was the financial crisis of the pits of New York, you know, is a great time to be there. That's the vitality and artistic creativity of the 70s was happening there. But it was uh, a collapsed metropolis and from a financial cycle, obviously, right before the new digital age kicked in. Uh, 1978, the New York Stock Exchange did the first electronic trading. We know what happened after that. Um, so metropolis is a nostalgic look back during the period of the megalopolis. And so the post-war American-driven global city is the megalopolis. And you drive in, I mean, you fly into Pudong Airport, you drive to the French concession on this expressway, which is, has the green veil of the landscape, you're in the megalopolis. If you get out of the French concession for a little while, you're gonna see a city that goes on for miles and miles and miles and miles connected by cars. Um, the third city is the mega city. And that's our little red dots here. And you see, we designers, how hopeless we are. We actually believe our buildings as metaphors can break that hierarchy, that somehow uh, residents of Ritz-Carlton will let the street vendors go to those luxurious terraces. <laughs> so you can see how vulnerable we are to critical theory. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jane Perone, and it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm going to keep my try to keep my comments really brief because I'm interested in the dialogue. But I, I definitely want to give you a background and perspective of where I'm coming from. It's a slight shift from Brian, um, I'm in the media design side of things. 
Um, I'm an assistant professor of media design in the School of Art, Media, and Technology at Parsons. Um, and I'm the director of the communication design program, which encompasses branding and advertising, media and broadcast design, interactive and new media, and graphic and package design. And about 38% of our students are international students. So that's part of what shapes the, the discourse in our program and is part of why this kind of dialogue is so interesting to me. And I'll elaborate on that um, in a minute. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, and coming at this from two perspectives as a design practitioner um, who's engaging with social scientists, but also as an educator and how we think about design education. And that's something I'm really eager to talk about here as well. Um, my personal practice uh, revolves in three areas, um, interface design, information architecture, and data visualization. And what's interesting of, of what's happening and the, the kind of uh, situation that we're in now with, with new media and network IT technologies, um, we're, we go, we're going beyond the idea of what communication design used to be in the past, where you created an, an artifact and you were very concerned with the aesthetics of that artifact, um, and thinking about things more as systems, processes, structures, and frameworks that we engage with and that are dynamic and complex. That's a completely, it's a very dramatic shift, and so how we how we make things in that situation, but then how we teach people how to make things in that situation is, is very new to everybody. So we're, we're trying to figure that out. Um, so one of the things that, that's been fantastic, and I too am fairly new to Parsons. Um, I've been a full-time faculty there for three years. And we've created a collaboration um, that we call the Global Exchange Laboratory. And that co collaboration started with Brian, Vijayanthi, and myself. And the, the dialogue and discourse that's been created out of that coming together of these disciplines has been really interesting and has really started to drive the questions that frame what I make. Um, so, sorry, I have to refer to my notes. Um, so the things that I'm concerned with, with, with these things are a user-centered design approach um, that's collaborative and that's also very research-oriented. Um, and, and that starts to ask questions and create things that tools that we can use actually go beyond representation, go beyond geographic or navigational mapping, but start to allow us to actually use these things analytically and also as a tool for discovery. So to actually understand what's happening in front of us because of how rapidly things are happening. Um, so questions that come up for the aspects that I work on are things of accessibility in a situation where we have extreme information overload. So it's not just scale of buildings that we're looking at, it's scale of information um, and the complexity of that information. Um, and that happens through how we build interfaces. So how do we make it so that everybody has equal access to this information? Um, also things concerning participation and collaboration. And is it collaboration among a few people or is it actually a collaboration among many people? And how do those people fit into the overall network or dynamic engagement of using these different tools? Um, a very important question that we talk about and that we ask, and it's not straightforward, it came up last night, the interplay between local and global um, and how we navigate that. Um, the idea of open development so when we start, I know uh, Ben started to bring up some of the politics of ownership and business and, you know, with a lot of these tools, Google is an enormous giant company that owns a lot of the technology we all rely on and it's proprietary. So, you know, how do we start working with open systems and use open development? Um, and finally, in the condition of constant and dramatic change, how do you actually make things? 
because we used to make things that existed and stayed that way. Now we have to make things that are constantly changing. So how do we create the ability, and this is where sustainability starts to come into question, but also the idea of flexibility and adaptability. Um, so those, those are some of the questions that, that we start to look at in the face of, of what some of the aspects of new media bring us, which is remixability, relational relevance, and again, as I said before, being able to discover things through these tools that you would not be able to see uh, directly. Um, let me just see if I have anything else to comment on. Yes, I, so, so I did say that I wanted to talk a little bit about how this relates to design education and why this dialogue and collaboration is so important to me. Um, in, in thinking about new ways of teaching design, um, the idea of facilitating cross-disciplinary collaboration has become so important um, because it forces designers to be a more, more engaged with the social context that they work in. And I personally just, in my own experience, my own practice, that has been a huge problem in the past with, with, uh, with how we teach design and, and how we make things. Um, and I think we approach design education now not with just how to teach how to make things, but asking why we make things and to what end and taking responsibility for the things that we actually put into the world. Um, but, the, and a key thing then is with the ability to talk about our work in such a way that there can be a public discussion and discourse about it and an opportunity for analytical or analytic um, reflection. So this is why I, I'm, I'm very thankful for this opportunity because uh, one of the, the gaps or challenges that I had probably you know, in the beginning of my career 20 years ago was the gap between um, programmers and what we call designers and that there was a different language and a different culture and an Ill inability to actually communicate to one another and to work together collaboratively to, to you know, make things. Um, and I see this now, we're, we're in a similar situation now as we move to this relationship with the idea of social science and how that intersects with design. And it's a very interesting thing. There are two very different cultures. There are two very different languages. And starting to see how those things can start to come together and understand each, is, each other's perspectives and approaches, I think that's an incredibly interesting thing. So. Thank you. Um, in a slightly confessional mode, um, and uh, here's a confession. I, um, I guess I was um, trained or, you know, uh, at the University of Chicago where Weber is read very, very closely um, by everyone from a freshman to a person who's just about to defend their dissertation just making sure that they were on the right side of the objectivity, value neutrality, um, and um, you know, ethical debate of um, uh, the vocation of doing social science. Um, but then um, I came to that uh, place <clears throat> having um, uh, fresh from the publication of um, uh, Writing Culture, um, the edited volume um, by Clifford and Marcus, which was, um, you know, really um, an analysis of the ways in which ethnography um, was written and what it represented, um, but in fact reached well beyond um, the profession uh, or professional anthropology um, to uh, catalyze uh, a, a real um, sort of, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, discursive um, revolution. Um, across uh, the humanities and social sciences. Um, and uh, it was, uh, so to put it uh, in one way, I would say that, uh, from that from that moment to today, something very interesting has happened because we um, have moved from um, thinking of uh, questions of discourse and language to questions of design um, um, being at the front and center of uh, what we do. So, for example, the, the text that was uh, circulated before uh, for the for this um, 
uh, seminar, Bruno Latour uh, is able to make the claim that design is Dasein. Um, and it is uh, a kind of a, a sort of, um, it captures the zeitgeist um, of this moment uh, in a very, very interesting way. Um, and as I said before, uh, for me, I mean, I, I think I have the good fortune of ha having been at a place where um, design um, was really at the heart of the institution itself um, and at the heart of what people were beginning uh, to think of, not simply in theoretical terms, but in terms of um, making and of collaborating and um, of, um, uh, of pedagogy. So this was, um, so this is, uh, I guess, where I'm coming from. And second, um, uh, so, uh, you know, in a true anthropological fashion, I, I have to say that I'm going to call on someone who, um, who may not realize but has become an informant, uh, Will Thompson, who um, was very kindly uh, showing us around Shanghai for a day, um, who said something very, very interesting. Uh, Will is here, um, he's a graduate student in anthropology at NYU, and he um, uh, has uh, been uh, looking to begin his um, fieldwork, um, although he's an old China hand, has spent a lot of time here. He said something very, very interesting. He said, um, a week before I came here, I uh, got my new iPhone, and I'm so excited by the possibilities that this has opened up for me as a researcher. And, um, and, 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 he, gave, and he gave me some, some very concrete examples of what this, um, this, this tool um, had made possible for him to imagine uh, that would uh, help him to explode out of a sort of conventional uh, way of uh, taking field notes, of uh, cataloging them um, and archiving them, and then producing um, a kind of analytic reflection or ethnography from them. And this, was, uh, this resonated very, very strongly with me because it, what it pointed to me was that we are in a space where we have the tools and we have reflections from um, people like Brian and Jane um, who have worked very, very closely with these tools. And we also have a kind of extreme public circulation, if you will, of at least certain aspects and pieces of these tools. So who among us, you know, has not used Google? I, you know, obviously there will, no one will raise their hand. Who among us has not used uh, in, or YouTube? Um, I would say uh, Facebook, I mean, I, I, I sort of... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> It's a bad example because I know Facebook, uh, I mean, this comes back to our, our sort of dilemmas of uh, where we are, our subjectivity as researchers, and uh, our self-image, our self-cultivation um, as people um, who um, study the network but are not in it or off it. Um, and I think this raises sort of very, very interesting and important political questions, um, which are at once theoretical, which is, uh, to go back to what Vicky was saying earlier, um, what are the forms of politics that these make uh, these tools make available to us? Um, and we and um, as as a student of uh, of the city, uh, and this and my work is uh, really based in Mumbai. Uh, again, I think all of us are sitting here in Shanghai, um, and which for for Mumbai, as I said, is a model of the future. Um, and we have um, this, this sense of being in a moment where um, change is not an option, but change is what is driving the form of the city. And in that, um, in that moment, um, doing research in Mumbai um, on the enormous kinds of displacements that the infrastructural projects have uh, produced, um, one realizes that uh, politics of the sort that um, are, are uh, visualized by those huge rallies in the streets um, are being um, very, very carefully undercut by uh, the production of various kinds of networks and coalitions. So for example, I, I went to study displacement in Mumbai and what I understood was that 
this uh, was not just merely a process of, uh, of uh, displacement, but it was a process of massive amounts of resettlement uh, involving coalitions of the state, of NGOs, and of political actors that had been mobilized into very specific kinds of networks. So there was a move and a shift away from the very public politics of the rally and of the protest uh, and into a very carefully orchestrated and choreographed um, set of, uh, of movements, um, which, as, as Brian um, brought up, uh, have everything to do with uh, producing the metropolis of the future. So, you know, the metropolis, uh, not as a nostalgic uh, look back, but actually as a kind of a control space of the future. Um, and in that context, um, f uh, the, what I have realized is that, for me, the temporality of ethno ethnography uh, needed to be um, really questioned. So the idea that I could uh, be uh, a traditional ethnographer, spending um, a large number of years in a particular place and producing an ethnography uh, at the end of you know, three years or four years of careful study of a particular local community uh, was, was totally destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, and this in part is a response, uh, is a critical response to the transformation of our objects themselves. And the one thing that I'd like to um, leave to the discussion is, um, is how um, the, the kind of uh, intersections or uh, our own sort of disciplinary spaces that we inhabit are being transformed, not just by a kind of, uh, uh, not just by the, uh, the transformation of our objects themselves, but by the fact that there is in fact um, a massive feedback loop between the technologies that we um, are, operate with on an everyday basis as non-researchers, as it were, or as, as, as ordinary uh, citizens, residents um, of, uh, of these kinds of places, um, on the one hand, and the kind of, um, uh, uh, of work that becomes possible when we move beyond the sort of uh, veil of this immersion um, into an analytic mode. So the question uh, I'd like to leave uh, the, uh, to the audience uh, or to open to discussion is how, as researchers, um, do we bridge that kind of um, very, very conscious mapping on of, uh, of the feedback loops between what we do in everyday life and what we uh, present as our work or as our research or as a products of um, um, as products for discussion in various kind of fora not just in the seminar room but outside as well <laughs>